What's up, peers? I welcome you to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I sit down with Janine Wurmer, uh, who is a journalist in the Bitcoin and privacy space. Uh, and we have a fascinating discussion about how uh, or what it actually means for journalists to be private uh, and to use uh, privacy best practices to stay secure uh, for themselves and their sources. Uh, and further, how they can be more self-sovereign and censorship resistant. And so speaking about publishing securely uh, and reliably in a distributed way uh, and uh, even, you know, getting paid for these and not with advertisement, which is censorship, but via, uh, you know, Bitcoin payments and other means. Um, one of the great contributions to the space that Janine has done is uh, the articulation of revision controlled journalism. Uh, and this is basically a way to, to prove uh, chronologically uh, the evolution of a certain research piece, um, uh, focusing also on timestamps. Uh, so to actually have Git commits uh, that that uh, proves a certain time uh, and uh, the the changes of each revision that have been made, uh, always with referencing sources uh, in such openly and, and transparently. Uh, I think it's a very interesting um, uh, focus on being transparent and audible and verifiable uh, that is very close uh, at the heart of every Bitcoiner who runs his own full node. Uh, so I think this is a type of journalism that is very much important uh, and that I think will thrive nicely alongside uh, the Bitcoin space. Uh, so again, if you want to support this type of journalism that we're doing here right now at the Join the Voice of the Cast show, uh, get yourself a Podcaster 2.0 uh, wallet. Uh, for example, Breeze Wallet, Podfriend, the Sphinx app. And here you can try out the latest and greatest features. Uh, for example, sending back some value uh, that you might have received here. Uh, in the form of Satoshis, uh, magically over the Lightning Network. Uh, it's a fun to try out and to play around with. Uh, so do so. Uh, but now, without any further ado, let's get into this episode today. So, Janine, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing good. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, very much. Uh, welcome. Uh, you've been doing some really nice work at both the Block Digest and at your uh, monthly newsletter about Bitcoin privacy at uh, this month in Bitcoin privacy. Great title. <laughs> uh, so what what is your recent work there? Uh, well, I started the newsletter last last year in June, uh, and I kind of I I I talk and research a lot about privacy and specifically Bitcoin privacy, and I just kind of wanted a place to, that's kind of how a lot of my investigation start is I'm very interested in something and I have a lot of notes on it and I think that other people might be interested in it. So I just publish the notes and with the way that I do journalism, it's very iterative. So when I find new things, I add it. And that's what I decided to do with my Bitcoin privacy research is to just turn it into a newsletter. Um, and I'm doing it in the same format that I've done a few of my other investigations, which is uh, to use version control, um, because, you know, this is a, a lot of the people I hang out with are developers. And so they know how to use tools like that. And so whenever there are mistakes, I can have people make pull requests to my newsletter and get things fixed. And, uh, you can see all the contributions people make. And I just like that. And, uh, also really grateful that, you know, I've, I've been doing it for less than a year and, uh, already got the attention of the Human Rights Foundation. I was not even aware that they were giving out grants to non-developers, um, doing stuff with Bitcoin privacy. So I was really happy that they, uh, thought I was worthy. Yeah, that's great and very much deserved. It, it really is a nice archive of knowledge. Uh, and again, I, I think the way that you create it is especially interesting. Um, uh, again, with this revision control system and, and basically a, a free source, uh, for, like free journalism uh, in the sense of free software development, I think it's very interesting. Let's dive a bit deeper into this. Like, where would you say are the, are the current uh, status quo established mainstream ways of, of writing, writing and publishing and editing an article? Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't have too much practical experience with how, uh, so-called real journalists do their job because, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a very unusual journalist and, uh, 
a lot of the processes that traditional journalists use are frustrating and counterproductive to me in terms of the what I think the ultimate goals of journalism are. But as far as I understand it, the standard practice is that you have a journalist or writer who writes up, uh, does research, hopefully does research before they start writing. Um, and they write a draft of an article and then they put that into some kind of content management system, um, either their own or at a media organization. Then it gets looked over by editors at some point. Uh, the editor makes suggestions for changes. They go back and include those. And eventually at some point it gets signed off on by whoever uh, makes the decisions about what gets published. Uh, it goes out for publication and you get, you know, the very classic format of so and so wrote this title article done. Um, sometimes you will get updates if they make mistakes and care about fixing them. So you'll get a little like italicized text at the bottom or the top saying, you know, here's something we got wrong or here's an important update. Um, but the thing that's always frustrated me, especially when that happens where it's not clear that changes were made after the fact. Um, it frustrates me when, you know, an article gets published and there are some major errors in it and they kind of just get fixed silently and you don't know who did them or what the reason is, or really, unless someone's archived the original, that there was any evidence of the mistakes being made in the first place. Um, and so my model for journalism is not only, uh, I mean, it's, again, it's, not too foreign of a concept to people who are already developers because open source software is now developed this way a lot where, you know, someone can publish some code, but if they do it in a Git repository and it's online, uh, then you had, can have other people making pull requests on that code uh, to suggest changes. And also when you have things like GitHub, it's very easy to see who contributed what code. Um, I mean, it's, you can see that in general, but GitHub kind of makes it a kind of social network experience. And so I just, I've always appreciated the fact that I can always see who's introduced what changes and it's very transparent. And I wish more of that transparency would be in journalism. And thankfully there have been a few examples of media organizations doing this to a degree. Um, for example, the markup. Uh, does a lot of their pieces where they have a very extensive credit section and they actually say, well, here's the journalist or journalists who wrote the article, but here's who did the data analysis that informed their, uh, their opinion. Um, here's someone who contributed the picture. Like they, they give credit to basically everyone involved in the piece. And I just feel like that's not only fair, but that's just being transparent. That's how journalism should be. Um, assuming, you know, everyone actually wants to be credited in the piece. Maybe some people don't want to, but I feel like most journalists, they don't get credited for work that they do. Um, and even worse, the people who should get credited um, uh, for maybe even introducing mistakes, uh, like editors, uh, in my experience, often do, um, they should be held responsible also for what they write. And so I wish it was the case that more journalism was written giving attribution to people who actually contribute the words that we read and make our decisions on. Yeah, I think that uh, attribution is, is quite important here, uh, you know, especially if uh, in, in the review process of who actually said something and who, who made the edits, and especially when there is more metadata available, like reasoning why this was a mistake and how this new proposal is, is fixing it. Uh, in, in what way do you incorporate that? Uh, like, I know that you're using Git, but to what extent do you, uh, do you know other people contribute to the same repository and, you know, commit messages and such? Like how much metadata do you actually put in, in this, uh, publishing process? Um, in my, uh, the, the way that I do it, I don't tend to usually include that much information in the, in the message. Um, just because, uh, I think if the, cause it just, I think it's just the way that I make the edits, I tend to like, make, uh, I could probably batch more things together into one commit, but I kind of make just separate commits and I try to label them correctly. Um, but yeah, I think there could definitely, there's definitely good reasons why, uh, if 
it was done sort of more professionally or thoughtfully in advance that you would actually maybe include more extensive information in the commit message to explain maybe why a certain change was made if that is necessary, but maybe it's not. If it's, you know, a spelling or grammar fix, I don't necessarily think you need to explain that. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that the changes should not only be evident, but there should also be room for providing some kind of explanation in the metadata for why a change was made. Yes, and of course, GitHub is a great place to look at the history of, of a Git repository and, and to see the changes and who made them, uh, even by reading the, the labels and commit messages. Um, but do you w want to include that more directly in the user experience of the reader? Like that there are on, on the public website, uh, you know, references to, to the Git structure itself. Like, do you think this is something for the actual reader front end? Um, I think it should be something that readers can toggle. Um, for example, I gave a, I, well, I didn't end up giving the presentation, but a presentation I prepared about this, about revision controlled journalism. There was a tool made by, um, Niha Narula called Hyperlinker where, uh, it was very simple. She just had it toggle, um, links, hyperlinks in an article because some people, when they're reading an article, uh, they ha having all of the kind of blue and underlined highlighted text is a bit distracting. And so they want to be able to turn it off. But on the other hand, they also want to be able to have the source information. So that could be something that you could toggle on and off while you're reading the piece. You could just read it as plain text. But if you wanted to see the source for a particular claim, then you would toggle the, the sourcing back on and be able to look more into it if you wanted to. And I think that's something you could also do. Um, if your underlying, uh, if the underlying structure of the article was, you know, using a Git versioning system, you could give the reader the option to see that and look through it. But if they didn't want to and didn't want to be distracted or didn't understand maybe, uh, that, then you could just have it turned off. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that would be a good option to have. One of the kind of considerations, especially in terms of privacy is, that if there is after publication some uh, privacy mistake in in the source text right where it would have been better to not reveal that information uh, having a very transparent editing record might be difficult to kind of hide a mistake uh, what what do you think about that argument yeah that that is true that is something that would have to be considered um my response to that would just be to you know, make sure you don't make mistakes like that in the first place, because to be honest, at the end of the day, the way that the internet already works, once you publish something, anyone, anywhere who loads that page can basically have a copy of it. So your mistake in a way, maybe it's not as, you know, immutable as it would be, <laughs> as immutable as a Git versioning, versioning system can be. Um, maybe it's not as immutable without that. But you have, you know, archival sites, you have people who just, you know, there are tools where you can make copies of HTML pages uh, with a browser extension uh, that I also use to make archives of pages. So, you know, those kinds of things already exist. So if the mistake is critical enough, um, I mean, hopefully either it gets fixed before anyone comes along and actually reads it or, uh, I mean, that that is a problem, but I think given given all of the other tools available for capturing mistakes that maybe you don't want to last um it's kind of uh, the the uh, benefit of using these tools i think outweighs that risk how much do you in the editing process kind of before you even publish it how much do you keep a, a record of the changes uh, and do you keep in mind that some of it will not be published in the future um, yeah, I, I do have investigations where, um, I kind of just have supporting material and notes where I, I'm not sure how to order it yet, or I'm not sure, like, I don't feel like I have a, a complete enough picture of whether it should be introduced into the investigative piece that I publish. So, um, I mean, that's also normal practice for journalists to have a lot of notes and information that never makes it into the final piece. Um, 
So I'm not really changing that aspect of it and saying that everything should be published. There are some journalists who may argue it may be valuable to actually publish everything. Um, but yeah, um, I, that practice, as far as I do it, is pretty similar to how other journalists do it. I have documents I have, you know, well, printed out or online that don't go into the final piece and are just notes. And I decide along the way when to introduce them. Yes, I see. What are some of the software tools that you use to author and maintain uh, these writings? Um, well, in, uh, I use pretty, um, you know, I use, uh, for example, uh, mega upload and various, you know, document storage, uh, services for files, preferably obviously ones that encrypt everything by default. Um, I also just use a lot of local storage devices. Um, just, uh, well, obviously I use, a uh, open source software as much as possible. So, you know, Linux, LibreOffice, um, for, in terms of word processors. And, um, sometimes if it's a collaborative thing where I have to work on a document with someone else, then it would be things like etherpads and stuff like that. Um, I just, in general, there's a lot of a, 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 any project where the software is open source and, um, especially for certain tasks, there has to be an emphasis on privacy and making sure that Either the connections are secure or the data is being encrypted on either end. Um, that's what I care about. Yes, I see. Very interesting. Um, have you ever considered adding Bitcoin timestamps into the process? Uh, yes, I have. That's a part of the model as I've outlined it in a few documents. And in one of my investigations, actually, um, I have uh, Peter Todd himself <laughs> introducing timestamps. Uh, on and off into the piece. Um, I think he's made th two or three in one of my investigations. So yeah, um, timestamps are valuable. Um, and that's actually the, the, one of the primary use cases uh, besides the monetary aspect that I see for Bitcoin to help journalism because, um, timestamping in terms of just having a way to establish that a certain document existed, um, before or at a certain time is very useful for certain use cases. Not not every piece necessarily needs that, but um, for anything where there's some time-sensitive aspect or risk of censorship, I think that that's valuable. And it goes very well together with Git commits, because there is software out there where every Git commit can be sent to the open timestamp server, uh, and yeah. you can publish the open timestamp proof alongside with that Git commit. Uh, and then therefore knowing that nobody else could have messed with this piece of data after that actual time in the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, it, it, I think it's very interesting for this side as well. Yeah, definitely. And what about uh, signatures or proof of identities or reputations? Where, where do you think this comes in? Uh, well, so by, by default, my commits uh, for my investigations that you can see on GitHub are signed. Um, and I do think that using a reputation layer is important, even for, um, even for journalists who may want to, you know, publish anonymously or pseudo anonymously. In fact, it may even be more important then because when you don't have a, you know, legal straw man, um, identity, uh, then reputation actually becomes more important because you're not relying on, you know, the state issued, uh, form of identity that most people think is so important to apparently our ability to speak or use social media or do anything important. Um, reputation then becomes very important. So using digital signatures to authenticate that you did or said something online is very important to the process. Um, especially if, you know, uh, you would want that if you were communicating with people who are, you know, more prone to, or not as willing to trust people as easily and are more technical and would be able to understand, oh, this message is signed. Therefore, you know, unless the key has been compromised, this is, this must be them. And as long as you trust their security practices with their keys, um, that's a very good way of, you know, not having to 
docs, docs your state ID with everything you do to prove that you actually are who you say you are. Yes, and uh, I, I think here, again, with, with both uh, um, like long-term identities as well as short-term pseudonyms, uh, signatures play an important role. Uh, maybe even the web of trust of PGP signatures, right? So that a new uh, pseudonymous identity can get some reputation by being co-signed from, uh, with other people uh, to kind of give more credit to the source itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I also think like one thing that I've used in one of my investigations, you know, the um, I've used, you know, if there's a actually still one of my investigations has a piece of information that um, is included where it's hashed with um, SHA-256. Um, it's a piece of information that at this point, I don't feel like there is enough value in publishing it, but it may be valuable in the future just because it's kind of sensitive. And so I included it, but I used SHA-256 to hash it first so that I could... Sorry, there's a coffee machine in the background. One second. Uh -huh, but that's very interesting. Uh, like to commit to a certain document uh, already in advance by hashing it, right? but, but choosing not yet to reveal it, but to later reveal it uh, while then still having a proof that it, in fact, is the same document uh, that was committed to in the, in, at the point of writing and not something else that was tampered with. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, I publish it so that, um, you know, with the, with the versioning and also with the timestamps, I can prove that I knew this piece of information earlier, but I'm not revealing it yet. Um, and that's the primary use case of um, hash functions. So... That's a you know very simple thing that I think more journalists could do that they don't um, either because they maybe they've just never thought of that or they're just not aware of it they're not technical enough um, but I think it's a valuable valuable and relatively simple tool um, in terms of publishing where there's a time based uh, aspect to it that you can prove that you knew something um, beforehand but you don't necessarily have to reveal it. Mm -hmm, I see. Let's maybe talk a bit more about the the research part. Uh, so so let's assume you're an extremely paranoid researcher on on some very sensitive topic. Uh, what do you think are some uh, drastic but very powerful measurements that can be taken to be more private in research? Um, well, you could say uh, I would want to say that kind of being a journalist is in many ways in contradiction to being a privacy advocate because the job of a journalist is often to find loopholes in information systems, whether technical or social, and that may lead to infringements of privacy and secrecy, hopefully more secrecy than privacy, um, or at least put them at risk of being infringed, whereas the goal of a privacy advocate is to help close those loopholes as much as possible. Um, so for example, I don't maintain a public record of every person or company I've ever worked for. And I don't even usually give out resumes when I'm applying for work, or at least when I do, I'm very, very, very selective about what I put in the resume. Uh, but a lot of people maintain, you know, their employment status and history profiles on sites like LinkedIn. And, um, one of the research tools I actually use a lot is people's LinkedIn profiles to find out, you know, oh, they've just moved to this company. Where did they work before? Is that maybe relevant? Um, it was very relevant in uh, 2019 with Coinbase's accusation of Neutrino because um, Neutrino was, a, as, as far as I knew, like I didn't recognize the name at all. I just saw it was, okay, blockchain analysis company. Um, so it didn't catch my eye until someone else pointed out, oh, I went to the LinkedIn profile of uh, Neutrino and it has a guy listed there who says he was, he used to work at Hacking Team and he just had this on his LinkedIn profile. It was amazing. And I also then later after uh, Coinbase very, very quietly tr transitioned them out as they, as Brian Armstrong said, um, there was kind of no message about when they were leaving, have they left now? Are they still there? Who's still there? Uh, and I found out at least one of them left, I believe it was June or July of that year. So like several months later, based on information that he put in his LinkedIn profile. 
So, you know, a lot of these kind of social networking, social media sites are very useful because oftentimes they're pretty easy to search. Um, I mean, if you really know what you're doing, there's all these courses you can take about how like doing a real deep dive into like Facebook data, for example, like and, and not even having special access of any kind, just knowing how to use Facebook's uh, search engine. Um, and also, as we saw with a project called Transparency Toolkit, um, they had an IC Watch project, which aggregated the public profiles of everyone who identified with the intelligence community on LinkedIn or used relevant keywords in their profiles. Um, the result of that is that even when people collect information that you voluntarily share with the world yourself, um, your perspective on it may change when it's displayed in a particular context. Um, because, you know, all of those LinkedIn profiles were public. They mentioned, you know, working with certain programs that we now know to be, you know, NSA, uh, FBI, whatever programs in the intelligence community. Um, we're, we're now aware of that. In fact, we found out about programs that we didn't know exist even from the Snowden documents. So that was very interesting. Um, just putting that in context and collecting all of this public information together. And suddenly people are mad that you're doxing them, even though technically they dox themselves. Um, and, but that's also, you know, this is relevant to regular people who maybe we don't want this to be happening to. Um, when you put your employment history on LinkedIn, you should be aware of the implications of that, especially when you consider the unknown future context, when you may be living somewhere else with someone else or in the same place under a different government or a different financial or social situation. Um, like a lot of this stuff has to do with memory, like our ability to remember and the internet, uh, as they say, never forgets. And memory is very important in a just society in order to hold people accountable for their actions, but in an unjust world that not only can't forget, but won't forgive, uh, then it can become a tyranny. Oh, yes, that's very eloquently said. Uh, so, yes, uh, keeping some information hidden uh, and not attributing many actions to yourself, obviously, uh, is, is very important. So I wonder, uh, how, what role plays the Tor network and Tor browser for you? Um, I I use it every day um, just because, um, I mean, I just use it from a basic standpoint of I don't want every website that I'm visiting to have my actual IP address. Um, it's just that simple. Um, whether it's, you know, it, it's not even necessarily that like I, I'm suspicious of the website or I'm afraid of it or something. It's just, I just, you know, if I can use something that doesn't share that kind of information everywhere I go on the internet, um, then I'm going to use it because, um, I mean, some people think, oh, Tor is slow or it's not usable. It's actually become, it's become so usable in recent years that it's basically, indistinguishable in many ways from regular Firefox, except for the thing where you get more captchas. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I use it. I use it every day. I also use other tools that in have the Tor network integrated into it. So everything runs over Tor, or at least has the option to. Um, and I think that's really valuable because, um, you know, especially with Bitcoin stuff, um, most people are thinking about, you know, what's on what's on the blockchain, which addresses are sending to which other addresses. But there's the other aspect, which is traffic analysis. Um, and actually, uh, there are, I, I, I would argue <laughs> that in the grand scheme of things, um, in terms of at least like nation state actors, the traffic analysis is probably the way that most users would be de-anonymized, not, not, not even necessarily through the blockchain data because of how extensive the, uh, that system of capture is. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's funny that people are very cautious about what information they put on the blockchain nowadays. While, of course, on social media networks, they put a bunch more, a much more sensitive information in much higher quantity. And it's not like that yeah. database is going to be forgotten either. Right? Not just Bitcoin is permanent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just find that I, I basically have a foot in two different worlds and I find that the skills in one help me with the other. And I'm constantly thinking about the consequences and ethics of decisions I make in each one from the perspective of the other in my work. 
Um, so when I'm thinking from the perspective of a privacy advocate, I think, what might other Snoopy journalists, uh, who are, you know, maybe they'll be interested in me for whatever reason, or someone even more skilled than a Snoopy journalist, what, what are the ways that they could find information about me? And I try to close those doors as much as possible. And then when I'm a journalist, I think, well, these are the ways that I think a journalist would, uh, or someone else snooping would try and find information about me. How could I maybe use that to find information about people that I'm looking into? So I kind of, I go back and forth. And so the skills kind of complement each other uh, in that way. Yeah, quite quite interesting to both be uh, on the offensive and defensive at the same time, so to speak. Yeah, I mean my I, I mean for the, my ethics don't change necessarily. Um, I mean I I do my investigations are not you know focused on like outing normal people for saying the wrong thing, having wrong think, as a lot of journalism has turned into nowadays. So. Whether I'm wear whichever shoes I'm wearing, I'm not I'm not changing my ethics, but I am I'm using the other perspective to better inform how I do my work and hopefully do it better. Exactly the importance of first principles very much. Uh, so I, I want to dive in uh, also in some m uh, more base layer tools. Like, w what are your thoughts on, for example, the Tails operating system or the Cubes operating system? Um, I've, I've been following them for a long time. Um, I've, um, personally used them in very limited contexts just because they are, uh, it's not, it's not for, for certain tasks, uh, like journalism, they're very, very important where you probably want to be using them every day, but for just kind of every day things, they can be a bit difficult to use over the long term for everything, especially if you, if you have, if you want to use certain types of software or applications that don't necessarily work well with that system, but um, yeah, they're very important, and I'm glad that they still continue to be used. Yes, I, I do think that uh, for for many journalists, especially, uh, these tools are, are essential, and so it's great to have them. Uh, but yes, lots of improvements to come, uh, especially in terms of usability. Now, one of the other important paths, I think, is publication. Um, so once you actually have done your research and, and written the article in a revision journalist way, uh, on, on what sources do you publish? Uh, and specifically, how do you prevent censorship of publication? Um, well, so, uh, I mean, there, so my kind of ideas for how to do this correctly are much more extensive than the way I've been doing it so far, um, because I have not been subject to censorship. Um, the, for example, my newsletter, I, it's very simple. I just have a basic, um, Jekyll blog site that I update the repository for. That's where I add all of, uh, the research to, um, and that goes for my other investigations. Of course, the other, the proper investigations, those are the ones with the the timestamps and I always make sure to keep backups after I make major updates in case for whatever reason it gets taken down and I lose the work um, that's up on GitHub. Um, so GitHub is not ideal for hosting because um, you know they're a they're a company. They have relationships um, business wise with Microsoft and also with ICE. So. Uh, GitHub as a company is obviously not ideal in terms of someone to rely on as a hosting provider. Um, something I'm really interested in is a project called Radical, um, R-E-D-I-C-L-E, which is actually, they're trying to create basically a distributed um, Git um, versioning client. So an actual distributed Git network. And because most people who use Git are using it through GitHub or GitLab. Um, and you with GitLab, you can self-host and that's good. Um, but I'm excited about a usable distributed um, Git versioning network. That would be really cool to use. So I'm hoping to use that in the future. Um, and But there's many other ways you can torrents and stuff like that to just make sure that you have backups of these things and to make sure that they can't get taken down. Uh, there's many ways to, unfortunately, the kind of journalism industry, uh, when they kind of, 
became aware of blockchains, got very heavily focused on it as a potential storage mechanism and also something basically somewhere to publish their work, uh, which I found very annoying. I followed the civil project extensively, which was funded by consensus and they were publishing articles on the Ethereum blockchain and they did not listen to any of my arguments about um, why that was a bad idea. And of course, predictably, they ended up failing not raising money uh, very quickly because um, not only was their process, it didn't make sense to people who knew what they were talking about, but also the they involved a token and the token had to obviously get into people's hands for it to be used. And to do that, they had to go through this whole KYC process for anyone who wanted to buy them. And it was just way too complicated for the average person, even the person who, you know, was a there was a journalist who like basically this was his thing. He he was very interested in this project and he complained about how hard it was to get these tokens. So if if it's hard for like a dedicated person, it's going to be even harder for, you know, just a normal person who just wants to read an article to participate in this system. So, uh, yeah. Blockchains as content storage mechanisms, no. Like, if you do that at all, it should be very limited, like the way that uh, WikiLeaks has done it um, in the past. Um, it should not be used as, like, let's just shove a bunch of words into the blockchain. Um, they just don't understand that these systems, you know, that affects their sustainability. If you're basically just shoving a bunch of data into it, that affects, as we learned with the scaling debate in Bitcoin, you there's consequences to those kinds of actions and they just didn't pay, they didn't pay attention to that at all. But you see, what is a blockchain? Well, it's a chain of blocks and Git, well, is also a chain of blocks. Right? Yeah. It chains that it commits. <laughs> so after all, right, they were right. Put everything on the blockchain, put everything in Git repositories. All yeah. of a sudden we have revision control journalism. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish that that was, I tried to, you know, suggest that to them, like, hey, you could do this thing that you want to do, but not in a bad way. Um, you could get, use get or something. And no, there's just, there's just too much money and too much hype for people to listen to reason. So, um, they just failed and that's what happened. And I believe now that there's some kind of advertising on the Ethereum blockchain company <laughs> instead of journalism. Yeah, uh, now that you bring up advertising, I think that leads us into an interesting rabbit hole to go down to, which is in general funding uh, of journalism. Now, wh what do you think is the current status quo uh, of funding? Um, well, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Um, I mean, basically every uh, journalism still very much relies on advertising. It's shifted in the last couple of years more to subscription models there's been a lot more articles where you go to them and it says you know um you know they have ads but they still say oh you can only read th three articles this month and then you have to subscribe or pay to continue reading more so there is definitely i think a shift away from completely relying on advertising because either the advertisers realized uh there's a lot of ad fraud or maybe it's not paying out as much as it used to but Advertising funding is still pretty ubiquitous. And in my presentation for the Lightning Conference in 2019, I talked about how Bitcoin and the Lightning Network can help journalism uh, in terms of three things, censorship resistance, privacy, and micropayments, and that it can address the, these kinds of political and economic issues that journalism faces if, it's, if they're both used correctly. Um, and so with Bitcoin, you know, as we all know, you can open a bit, anyone can open a Bitcoin wallet and then they can publish or share an address somewhere and anyone in the world can send you money and they don't have to know who you are and you don't have to know who they are. Um, maybe technically under your country's laws, you do have to know who they are, but it's not a feature of Bitcoin. So too bad. Um, and if you use various privacy tools, then it's harder for anyone to know who either of you are, or at least how much Bitcoin either of you has. Um, in total, if you're not reusing addresses. Uh, but it's, for me, it's not just about integrating payments into journalism or even being able to make smaller payments, which is, you know, maybe part of the reason that a lot of people don't pay for journalism is the kind of lower threshold for making those kinds of payments is just still too high. And they'd like to be able to make smaller payments that aren't as efficient uh, with fiat. 
But um, I think it's significant because beyond just individual journalist choices about whether to use Bitcoin, if you have more journalists and whole media organizations and maybe even whole content creation platforms using Bitcoin as the native currency, then you have the incentives to counter the prevailing economic model of the internet as it stands, which is to violate privacy as a given by collecting and monetizing information about people. Um, since there's, there's just so much friction to, besides, you know, the subscription model or the Patreon model to rely on traditional online payments by comparison. Um, and there's a really interesting section in a book titled Beyond WikiLeaks, um, in an essay, Weak Links in WikiLeaks, How Control of Critical Internet Resources and Social Media Companies' Business Models Undermine the Network Free Press. Um, quite a mouthful, but I do recommend that book because um, it kind of summarizes the the Twitter order case that happened at the beginning or it opened at the beginning of December 2010 when the banking blockade was launched by the Department of Justice against WikiLeaks. And one of the things they did was they ordered Twitter to give them the account records of various people related to WikiLeaks and also argued that they should not be told that this was happening. And they also did this to other companies like Google and Amazon. And Twitter was one of, I can't remember if they were the only one or just one of the very few, but possibly the only company who actually fought this. And one of the arguments that DOJ uh, made was the good old, you have no expectation of privacy because you agreed to the terms of service. Um, and there's some good lines in there by the author um, of this essay where he writes, uh, more sweeping implications flow from two other directions. The first is the poor analogy the court draws between the internet and banks to ground its decision as to why the companies of the former type must hand over subscribers information just as much as the latter type do. Twitter, Facebook, and Google's terms of service policies are about maximizing the collection, retention, use, and commodification of personal data, not privacy. It is as if the ruling is intentionally out of whack with the political economy of the internet so as to give the state carte blanche to do with digital intermediaries as it pleases. So I think that anyone, what, what anyone should realize after hearing this is that financial surveillance is not only surveillance through and through. But financial surveillance policies are what lay the groundwork for other kinds of surveillance. And many people seem to think that we can have financial surveillance or financial surveillance is like the only good form of surveillance, but we can still protect privacy elsewhere. And I think that this argument or this belief is fundamentally untrue, um, as we could see with this case. And so journalists should care just as much, if not more, about their financial privacy as they would privacy in other areas of their life. Yes, yeah, so I think we see it more and more, right? That, uh, privacy and, or, well, especially censorship resistance, uh, as, as the core argument, uh, has, has to be defended. And of course, privacy is a easy and, uh, and profitable way to defend, right? Because if the attacker does not know who you are, well, he cannot really attack you. But maybe a bit further down the line, like, where do you see the future of publishing, uh, in a self-hosted infrastructure? Um, I think, uh, well, for one, um, I mean, again, WikiLeaks is a great example of kind of, the, they're one of the groups that have really pushed the boundaries in this area because they use mirrors for their website to protect themselves against censorship. They have, you know, servers and backups in multiple countries and especially in, you know, secure locations, um, in terms of, the, 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 how they get documents from sources. They've championed, you know, secure drop and those kinds of systems to enable people to securely and anonymously submit information to journalists where the journalist doesn't even necessarily know who the source is. And sometimes that's not even something journalists are willing to do. A lot of the time they do want to know who their source is and they're not willing to take information from anonymous sources. So even that in itself is kind of a radical thing. Um, and I do think that, uh, in a lot of countries, um, especially with a lot of them moving more and more towards wanting to control a lot of aspects of the internet, um, I mean, they already control so much of the financial aspect of the internet, so effectively they control, um, anything else that relies on the financial aspect. Um, a lot of them will have to increasingly adopt tools that 
combat this. Um, and that involves, you know, self-hosting, that involves using secure messaging tools, that involves basically taking ownership and responsibility and custody of their information as as we try to encourage people to do with their Bitcoin keys, because if you have it stored in the journalistic equivalent of Coinbase, um, they can, you know, cut you off at any point and not only cut you off from your ability to reach your audience, um, you know, from the powerhouse, but also obviously your your financial um, access, because a lot of journalists, you know, they get when they get paid through these media organizations, they are then subjected to the whims of those organizations and whether they want to continue contracts. And as we've seen with things like Substack, now in general, Substack is not ideal because basically it's a it's like a technologist version of a media company where it's not so much concerned about edi- editorializing. Um, but it still retains that power. It, it's the same kind of infrastructure, the same model. So in the future, they could also censor anyone who writes on their platform. Um, they may have done so already. I don't know, but I think the, the, the good kind of marker of Substack is that there's a lot more journalists that are seeing, Oh, I can become independent and I don't have to be in financial ruin because I'm on my own. I can have. Um, a somewhat more independent income where you're getting paid directly or somewhat, you know, Substack is still the intermediary, but you're getting paid as an individual journalist. You're not, you know, it's not a subscription to the media company that then gets distributed and broken up by that company based on how valuable you are to them. It's based on how valuable readers find you. Um, so that funding model, I think, will probably increase as well. And hopefully with the option to actually get paid directly with things like Bitcoin, where you're, you know, you have your own address on your own profile and things like that with uh, something like Libra Patron um, with BTC Pay Server and things like that. Yes. And, and one additional Bitcoin payment option that I would like to highlight is what is now possible with podcasting 2.0 and the yeah. value addition to the namespace uh, in the RSS field. Um, which enables payments both per minute or, you know, one time off boosting payments uh, to a certain lightning network node. Uh, I mean, that is the, the perfect way of, of paying the journalist directly or even multiple journalists in a, in a split up way. Uh, how do you think that this will change the equation? Yeah, I, I'm, I've looked at that stuff. I'm definitely excited about it. Um, and, uh, I've also noticed there are a lot of journalists who are, they, they still do written pieces, but they are also shifting to audio, um, formats to either, either, you know, just to share an audio version of their articles or to, that's where they publish their interviews with people that maybe they don't do a full article or write up on. So I definitely think that either they're incorporating, um, podcasting into, the the media that they deal with or maybe that that's the only media that they do um as podcasters uh because in a way podcasters can be journalists in a lot of cases even if it's not written so um yeah i'm excited about that format and uh micro payments because that you know there's been a lot of talk for that for years and i think podcast is a good format for it because apparently i remember there being some kind of complaint uh a few months ago about how the there was some like call for censorship from uh i can't was the new york times there was some complaint from like journalists about how podcast platforms weren't being like censored or or kind of managed enough like there was too much free there was too much freedom <laughs> too much free speech which i found hilarious um so maybe that's also the area where uh you get your free speech money <laughs> Yes, I think free speech money uh, is a great combination here. Um, and w- one important thing, right, is that pod- or the RSS field is not just about podcasts, right? You can have videos and uh, even websites and articles in an RSS feed as well. Uh, and of mm-hmm. course, the Bitcoin integration uh, can be applied in all of these models as well. So it's it's a very, very broad improvement. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting because the the guy who um I can't remember his name, but he's ba- like he's described as the father of podcasting because he's done Adam it for Curry. 
decade, yeah, decades. So, um, and he wasn't a, I, I, as far as I'm aware, he wasn't really a Bitcoin person before this. He just, you know, he, it sounds like he was just experimenting with ways to improve podcasting because he's done it so long. Yeah. And to, to be honest, I actually think he made one of the biggest contributions to Bitcoin in 2020. Uh, because getting everything of this rolled out and actually implemented across multiple clients now, uh, is, is impressive with already now quite a lot of traction. Uh, so the, uh, I, I would say quite a successful project. Yeah. And now the only problem is, uh, you know, I mean, when you're dealing with micropayments, you're, uh, you have the issue, at least if you're in the United States of, um, I mean, anything with lightning, people have been wondering, like, how do I declare this for taxes? Because the U.S. still has this really draconian, stupid rule about you have to declare everything and calculate the capital gains on every transaction uh, that you make. And so uh, that, you know, to get regular people to start using Bitcoin for this is going to be a challenge if they have to worry about that. Um, either they're just going to have to ignore that uh and try to use bitcoin as privately as possible or they're going to have to wait for this apparent bill that uh organizations like coin center are trying to get uh through to congress about having a minimum threshold like six hundred dollars below which you don't have to do that kind of nonsense but um yeah accounting is uh fun <laughs> And with with the ongoing hyperinflation, six hundred dollars will buy you uh, maybe a old piece of bread in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see how the regulation goes. But uh, I mean, ultimately, the the software is here and people are using it. Uh, and uh, again, it will be very difficult to shut down. But yes, there there might be more attacks coming on on other layers. Yeah. As usual, the government is usually only either squashing or incentivizing innovation in terms of squashing other things that then incentivize people to route around them. So, Yeah, we will see. Well, but, but hopefully uh, these Bitcoin payments solve uh, at least some of the problem. But still, the Block Digest is not yet on Podcasting 2.0. What's up here? Uh, yeah, it's not. Um, part of that is... Um, just because we've just been busy and I, I was away for quite a long time and yeah, um, we, we haven't figured out how to handle that aspect. We do want to do it and we've been talking about it for months. Um, we just haven't gotten around to it yet. I mean, it, it is very simple to, to just go to podcasterwallet.com and sign in with the email address of your RSS feed and just provide a lightning note public key. Um, but, but the issue here is, is that then the same public key is used for all the episodes. Um, mm -hmm. what, what is already possible, uh, but only in a self-hosted uh, variant, if you actually host your own podcast or at least create the RSS feed manually, um, that you, uh, can provide, um, a, a per episode lightning node public key. Um, so that for each episode, for example, you could get the public keys of the uh, guests on the show. Or, for example, a certain donation campaign. Um, uh, and maybe even that would be possible to change these inside the episode through all different chapters. So that, uh, for example, right now, uh, let's say we would make a donation to uh, the join market uh, lightning node. Uh, and if the user actually clicks on boost right now, the donation would go directly to join market just for these couple seconds uh, that we talk about it. I think there's a lot of potential on how to apply this. Yeah. Um, I mean, for us, the, uh, the technical aspect of how to implement it is not the most difficult thing. That's relatively easy. It's more to do with like, um, you know, how do we account for this money? What do we do with it once we have it? Uh, we haven't, uh, we just haven't gotten to that point of finding an answer to that question. <laughs> It, it might probably be even a, a smart strategy to just huddle a lot of this, uh, like to earn a lot of Bitcoin in, in, in any way, shape or form. Huddle it for a while, and then as soon as the bureaucracy comes after you, those Bitcoin will be substantially more valuable, and you can, with just a fraction of them, hire an incredible accountant and lawyer to take care of all the problems. <laughs> Maybe that will work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for this kind of... I mean, that's... I, I'm much more of a uh, prepare and advanced person, so um, I would probably want to check all the boxes. Uh, 
ahead of time before that happens. <laughs> that is for sure the, the less reckless and probably more wise strategy. <laughs> not not that I not that I don't have ways to, you know, disappear and not have to deal with any of this, but if I, you know, want to still participate in public life to some degree, um <laughs> And not not give all of my money to lawyers. <laughs> yes. Certainly. What what is the phrase? An ounce of preparation is worth what? What is that phrase? Uh, a pound what? of uh something. <laughs> a lot, a lot is what it's worth. <laughs> okay, Jenny, we we spoke about a lot of uh, topics in regards to journalism and privacy, but uh, are there any uh, rabbit holes that we did not yet go down through? Uh, well, I have a lot of thoughts about the fat F, <laughs> um, and just how, uh, well, we just did actually, uh, on Block Digest, we did an interview with Nick Carter that should be published relatively soon. And we did talk about the, I, I just, I just find it because when all of this stuff is announced, so oh, they have a new draft and it's going to be long and it's going to be terrible. It's all going to suck. And I had to keep telling people that, you know, part of the reason we're all freaking out about this is because that we believe these types of organizations actually have power in the first place when they're not even like they don't even have the, you know, the badge of being democratically elected. They're just literally they're they're just talk groups. They don't have any actual authority. They make recommendations. And they make all of these threats about how if you don't follow our recommendations, there will be diplomatic consequences. And it's like, okay, but but who enforces those diplomatic consequences? Like this, none of these people are elected. They don't have a lawmaking authority. They just make recommendations, and their recommendations tend to be really awful and go towards more financial surveillance. So the first order of business is to just remind people that this is not law. These are recommendations. Um, and all of the banks who are preemptively implementing things that they say should be, I mean, in general, they're just giant red flags. That's a giant red flag to me that I wouldn't want to be involved with those banks or those businesses because it just, it just shows so little gumption that they're like it's especially if it's not even something they want to do or they're against it, but they do it anyway. Um, it just makes me feel like, well, when, <laughs> what would it like if you're going to cave to such a tiny threat? Um, you're going to cave to much bigger threats in the future. And I don't want to give you my money. I don't think anyone should give you money if you're not willing to stand up for your users and their privacy. That just doesn't make sense to me. So. Like our response to these kinds of, you know, kind of waves of banks blocking people or implementing these compliance procedures is just to say, well, we're not going to do business with you anymore because you're, you're, you're clearly, you know, just waving the white flag and not standing up for any principles that I care about. So I'm not going to give you money anymore. Um, you know, uh, I believe in the Cypherpunks book, uh, Julian Assange said, where you put your money is where you put your power. So stop putting your money <laughs> with people who don't represent your principles, especially people who don't even represent you at all and give you advice that they're not, they don't have any authority to actually enforce. Yeah, I think that's, that's very pressing, uh, and it's kind of a shame that we see a lot of the companies in the Bitcoin space being regulated uh, to the eyeballs. Uh, and w with a lot of privacy bad practices. Um, wh what do you think about the new addition of this travel rule uh, that you need to prove the ownership of a address uh, before withdrawing your Bitcoin from a custodian? Um, I mean, well, I just think it's, I think it's unsustainable and largely unenforceable. Um, because like you can say this is my address, but it could be someone else's address. Like the only way to prove that an address is actually yours is if you were to provide them with a signature or something to, but even that, like they, how do you prove that you made a signature? You could have asked the person that you were sending, you're sending the Bitcoin to, to just generate a signature that says anything they want. Like unless, unless you get them on video live signing 
a sig- like signing this address to say that it's theirs, you, I don't see how they're going to enforce that. That's like kind of too much work for them to do. Um, so one, it's unenforceable. Two, again, it's just more unnecessary financial surveillance that like even the compliance people are now complaining that this is too much. We have too much information that we don't know how to deal with. When the compliance people are complaining, um, that's when you know things are getting really stupid um, because like, uh, and what I find amazing is, you know, once again, you have these blockchain analysis companies saying, oh, they're just putting their hands up and saying, all we do is we analyze the blockchain. It's all publicly available information. Don't be mad at us. But then on the other hand, what they're actually doing in the, they're, they're basically lobbying groups. Um, like CypherTrace was interviewed by the CEO of CypherTrace was interviewed by Laura Shin and he was giving rather detailed information about the schedule of the, this, uh, fat F guidance. Uh, like when that would, you know, when, when the review period or the public consultation would close, when there would be group meetings, like he's, it sounds like Cypher Trace is very involved in these negotiations and these recommendations. So you have these companies who are pretending like, oh, we're not doing anything. We're just analyzing data. It's like, no, you're actually using your resources to, to, not only not stop increasing financial surveillance, but to encourage it because it fits your business model. Like these, even if right now, even if you have a blockchain analysis company or blockchain surveillance company that says, Oh, we only analyze the blockchain in a few years time, it might make more sense for them to be handling KYC data. And I think CypherTrace actually has um, tools and services that do that already. So it fits within their business model to advocate for more financial surveillance because that's what they already do, uh, in a commercial setting. But now they're trying to get governments to basically force people to listen to them and use their tools. And I think that's disgusting. These people, like, again, I, 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 they are basically, for me, they're people who are on a blacklist because unless they, unless they come forward and they atone for what they've done, they are not only increasing financial surveillance in the Bitcoin space or in the in cryptocurrencies in general, they're increasing financial surveillance as a whole. So I don't want to support them. And I think they, these are not people that like if, and unfortunately if you use custodial exchanges, you're, basically funding these people because the custodial exchanges are using these tools to check your coins and check all your friends coins um if 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 you're not following the not your keys not your coins rule um then effectively you're submitting to these people uh because you're putting your money at the behest of their decisions and how risky they deem you uh and i don't want to be subjected to that as much as possible my money stays in my hands and in my control. And so if they want to say I'm risky, it's like, fine. Um, there are millions and if even billions of people around the world, you would also deem risky. And that's a big enough economy for me to continue to live. And I don't have to care what you say. I, I very much agree that abandoning uh, to work with such companies is the most straightforward approach for individuals. Uh, but there is still for me an open question about how software developers should handle this. Uh, because now, for example, should wallets like Wasabi implement a efficient and user-friendly signature proof of an address so to make it easier for users to comply? Uh, do you think that this is a, a like good to implement? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, if I was a developer, I wouldn't. Um, that's not something I would do. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, again, it all depends on how much of the draft guidance actually gets, you know, finalized. And then it all depends on whether that actually gets accepted by the so-called member states that consider themselves followers of FATF guidance. And then it depends on whether they will actually take steps to enforce that on their populations. Um, so yeah, being a software developer and having this kind of uncertainty hanging over your head is clearly not good. Um, and you know, I'm not going to tell anyone what to do, but you know, the, what LavaBit did with, uh, when they were ordered to, you know, give data to the U S government about Snowden's email records was they literally just shut down their business 
And, you know, for me, I mean, maybe that is, maybe that is the best decision, decision to make rather than to, you know, kind of just bend over and sort of comply, uh, with these policies, even though, you know, they obviously go against the ethos of a wallet like Wasabi, which is focused on privacy. So, uh, I don't, I don't know what to do there. Um, maybe the best thing is to just either you have to blatantly go against these policies or, uh, the best thing is to just ignore them and maybe shut down. Who knows? But I think a lot of people won't do that. And Bitcoin as a system has enough support now that I think a lot of people would put up a fight and not just bend over or even shut down because that implies that the other side has enough power to actually enforce this. And again, I don't think that it's, I, I don't think it's realistic that this is, a lot of this is even enforceable. Yes. And where this gets a bit more complicated though is because the feature of proving ownership of a coin, it can be useful in other contexts, right? And it can be used voluntarily by, by individuals to just be more effective and, and prove things to each other. Right? Inherently not a bad feature per se. The question is just if the, if the reasons why the user requests a feature is specific government coercion to, to act in a certain way. Uh, should that itch be scratched, uh, or, uh, or rather not? Uh, it's, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, you could argue that in general, it might just be a good, you know, it might just be a good coin control feature, like another management tool. So I guess you could do that if you have a subset of your users who just feel like there's no other choice but to comply and they still want to use the wallet and maybe that will at least keep them in Wasabi when they could you know, go off to worse wallets. Um, yeah, there are arguments for that. Yeah, exactly. If the user already sacrifices his privacy against one of these uh, centralized exchanges and the government, uh, then of course using Wasabi will make the situation a lot better because per the status quo is very bad and after a coin join, things could improve. Uh, so yes, that might actually be a, an argument for adding such features just to enable those users who are being victimized and, uh, and un unjustly interrogated uh, to give them some opportunity to, to, to redeem their privacy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, any other further topic uh, that you have in mind for today? Um, nope, unless you have uh, miscellaneous questions or something. <laughs> Um, so let's see what, what are some of the things that you w want to work on in the near future? Uh, did you like find kind of a groove with the monthly publications of the, uh, this month in privacy or did you have some new uh, things coming up soon? Yeah, I'm actually, I am trying to do more with revision control journalism to, uh, my goal is to, well, it's been for a number of years since I've kind of written stuff about the model is that I want to actually integrate them into something like a website or platform or tool or something where all of the things that I mentioned, which, you know, they already exist and they're already functional and don't need me to build them or maintain them. Um, they already exist and it's just a matter of putting them together in a way that's usable for other journalists besides me. And also me in general, you know, it's make it easier for me to do what I want to do. Um, and then in terms of the newsletter, I do kind of soon want to, um, I want to do more kind of audio, uh, events where I either it's a Q and A or some type of podcast. Like I'm currently name squatting Panopticast, which I haven't used for an actual podcast, but I've just been using it to share the newsletter each month. Um, so I may do something with that along those lines and getting the grant from the Human Rights Foundation helped with that because um, there's definitely interest and now I have resources to do that. So hopefully I can expand that more in the near future. Yeah, I've been following uh, the Panopticast uh, at Twitter for a while now, and every time I see it, I'm somewhat disappointed that there is not yet a podcast out there. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to actually hear it, so it's it's great that maybe there's uh, more of you coming out on that front soon. 
Yeah, I have sketches for a few episodes, but I haven't, um, some of them are more elaborate than others, and I haven't decided how to do that if it was just to be a relatively standard podcast format, or if I would, I'm, I'm almost tempted to make it more ephemeral, where the podcast is, it's not so much a podcast, but I just do kind of episodes that are you know, live streamed with Jitsi and they're, I mean, as, as far, as far as Jitsi is ephemeral in terms of I'm not making a recording of the conversation, but anyone who participates might that I just make the episode where I talk about a topic and then I talk with other people who join and just have discussions and they never get recorded. It's just kind of whoever joins the Jitsi, uh, gets to hear the episode. <laughs> and maybe I have a donation portal, like a payment or something up so people can donate. Yes, I think this would be quite interesting. Uh, I like that aspect of non-recorded instant conversations. I think they evolve quite a lot of interesting ideas, uh, as you're more likely to share things if you if you know that you're not kept on record and held accountable for the crazy ideas that you share at that moment. Yeah. Yeah, and it would be cool to get Bitcoin payments directly integrated into Jitsi. I mean, some nice lightning uh, magic to send money in between the participants of a call would be very interesting. Yeah, I think in the meantime, um, I mean, even the Human Rights Foundation now has a pay them to make donations to their Bitcoin dev fund. So um, I think that's also, again, a good privacy tool where I can get donations without even publishing an actual Bitcoin address uh, and there's not a clear record that anyone can look up of all the donations I received. Um, again, still need to figure out the accounting for that, uh, but it's not as necessary when you actually have good privacy tools. Yes, and of course, BTC Pay Server, right? a, a great way to yeah. get paid in Bitcoin uh, privately with no address reuse, uh, well, of course, first and foremost, um, but also Lightning payments enabled, right? which is great. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, lots of lots of cool tools, cool tools that can be used already now, uh, and let's see what we will build further in the future. I think it will be quite exciting. Uh, I think there are a couple of cool, cool new technologies coming together that will shake things up. What do you think? Yeah, I'm like I said, uh, the the technical. I think all the technical tools are there. Um, being able to implement them, it's just uh, all of the bureaucracy and accounting in the background that uh, people may or may not decide to be accountable for, and that is obviously a uh, issue to deal with. But um, in terms of again, every I'm every time I have to use a bank account or any fiat outside of cash, I am just constantly annoyed and amazed that this system even functions <laughs> at all. Uh, for example, I got a book recently and technically at this moment, I have gotten it completely for free, even though I, you know, ordered it online because the, the payment, uh, is scheduled for some time over the weekend. And so, yeah, I got a book delivered without paying for it. And so it's like, oh, I, I just when it happened, I was like, wow, this is worse than a zero comp Bitcoin transaction <laughs> because the transaction doesn't even exist yet. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I'm just, just, I, I don't understand how people stand it. Um, Bitcoin is just so much easier, uh, to me in terms of the user experience, which a lot of people say how bad the Bitcoin user experience is, but I, find it less complicated than online banking and shopping it's uh, shopping with you know fiat or paypal and all of these payment applications or processors just bitcoin is so much easier i don't know how people stand it so um <laughs> like i feel like a lot of this stuff is going to accelerate uh fast enough that we're going to leave all of them behind and we're not even going to remember what it was like to uh use stuff like paypal or yeah, Venmo, all of these things. Yes, very much agreed. And both UX and UI and security and under the hood magic will improve drastically. Uh, so already now it's pretty damn good, but still clunky. Uh, so yes, in the future, I think on all fronts, we will have massive improvements 
uh, to make it a, a night and day difference between the fiat regime. Yeah, and also in terms of privacy, like I, it just I, it just every time it just annoys me that every time I make a payment, I have to think, okay, who am I sharing my personal information with now? What could they do with it? Should I even? Is this even worth? Is this purchase even worth it to do this? And I've never really had to think about that with Bitcoin ever because that's just not necessary. In fact, I've seen a number of, I've seen a number of online shops that say, you know, oh, if you pay with Bitcoin, you don't have to give us any personal information. But if you, you know, want to use PayPal or bank transfer, you need to give us this, this, and this, basically your entire life history. So, um, it's so much better in terms of privacy. Not just for journalists, but just anyone using money. It's just ridiculous how much personal information we have to give just to share value with people and get products and services. Yes, that's so true. And I think, you know, especially with podcasting 2.0 and these lightning payments integrated, like this is a value transfer for, for journalists, uh, in a extremely private way compared to the fiat regime. Uh, I mean, of course, no names connected, uh, or required uh, by these lightning nodes and, very difficult to for others to see uh, transactions. I mean, sure, there are privacy problems in today's Lightning Network, but again, compared to the fiat regime, infinitely more private. Right? So this already existing today in a bare bone form and being much superior in the future is, I think, very, very promising. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a really good podcast called the. I, I don't think it's on um, that feed, but. Uh, the privacy security and OSINT show, um, by a guy who actually, his, his business is actually to help his clients improve their privacy. And there are ways that you can get financial privacy with fiat and without being super rich and just, you know, doing offshore company, which is like what you'd think would be the way to do it. Um, it, it is relatively difficult. Um, still and kind of expensive. Um, and if you're not independently wealthy, you're being protected by a large media organization. Uh, most journalists, as it stands, probably can't do that. So yeah, um, we have to look at other options, but, um, there are some ways I would recommend that podcast because it gives advice also about, um, publishing without doxing everything about yourself. Um, that's a good resource. Oh yeah, one of the things, I mean, of course there are levels of how much you reveal about yourself when you publish something. Uh, I mean, probably doing it in meat space uh, is, is one of the most revelations. And then doing it in cyberspace with video camera and audio, of course people will still see your face. Uh, but for example, in this podcast, we don't show any faces, right? So uh, here we only reveal our audio. Uh, but even in, in written form, you probably still reveal a lot of metadata about the way that you write and the words that you use and the grammar mistakes that you make. Right. So w what do you think, what are active steps that we can use to improve our privacy for complete anonymous publications? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a very, that's a very, uh, kind of complicated area of, I mean, basically you're talking about, you know, linguistics and, how to identify, you know, ha whether certain structures of sentences and word choice and things, how that can be identifying and how to change that so that you're not doing that. Um, that's, yeah, that's very, uh, complicated. And, um, I mean, I think really the main thing to worry about there for most people is that if you've ever published anything before using your legal name, um, then you have to be careful about whether once you start publishing anonymously, whether that can be tied back to the stuff under your name. If you use similar words and sentence structures to that, that's the main thing. Um, I mean, you can also find out a lot about a person without having that. And if they, you know, purely start off anonymously, uh, you can find out things about like, for example, um, I mean, I actually, uh, it, this was never intentional, but I read a lot of uh, British English literature growing up. So I actually use a lot of British English in my writing. And so it's a lot less obvious that, you know, just I have an American accent, but I often write like a British person. Um, so I'm not even doing that intentionally. That's just something that I 
I picked up in my life, and it kind of obscures my origins a bit. Obviously, now I've revealed it, so it's not a secret. And no, I'm not Satoshi, <laughs> because apparently Satoshi also wrote with British English, but may have been American. Who knows? Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that has to be considered, especially if you do long-form investigative pieces like I do, where there's a lot of words. Um, a lot more material to do that kind of analysis on. Uh, yeah, that is something to consider. Um, not something that I specialize in, but definitely something that could get you caught or at least reveal a lot of information about you if you're not aware of it. Do you know of some good software that automates this? I mean, for example, for speech, you know, there are voice mufflers that change the sound of the voice, but, but still you don't change the actual words and the rhythm and things. It's, uh, and also for the written word, right? Do you, do you know of some automated way for text? to be kind of rearranged in the different grammar styles so that it's no longer that easy to fingerprint? Um, I am not personally aware of anything that does that. Um, kind of the, the, the cheap way that I've seen or heard some people do it is that they just put their stuff through like a um, translation engine. So they'll translate into a different language and then translate it back using another translator and that kind of rearranges a lot of times the words a bit and that can obscure things but uh i don't know how effective that is um but yeah it would be good to have a tool if there is one that maybe does that and changes things to a different style than the one you used um yeah that would be useful um in terms of voices yeah i mean this is something i mentioned on tales from the crypt when i went on there uh there was a paper that i read about how you could construct a relatively accurate image of what someone looks like based on their voice, um, which I can kind of see how that would that would be possible, um, you know, because there are lots of things that you can tell about a person from their voice, but also I've heard people talk uh, where I've heard them talk and then I've met them in person and they look completely different to what their voice, like the image that I had in my head of what they would look like based on their voice. And it was completely different. So um, I don't know maybe how effective that is or consistent, but that is a thing where your voice can uh, give away a lot about you and that might become increasingly easy to give that away. And uh, yeah, I've definitely uh, screwed myself there because there are <laughs> dozens of hours of me talking on the internet now. So despite the fact that I don't share my face or go on live streams with my face uh, or share pictures, um, yeah, maybe it was all for nothing. <laughs> yeah, layers of defense, but it doesn't matter how many layers you have of wall, uh, like of stone, if a dragon flies over them. Well, <laughs> screw that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if I, again, if I, there, there are people I know who don't talk on the internet for that reason. They're worried about things like that. Um, I'm in general, uh, you know, I've just kind of accepted the fact that I've, I, I think I do more than most people. I haven't completely gone to, uh, I haven't completely gone dark. So, uh, this is just, uh, a risk that I take and in general I'm not famous enough yet where I think too many people are interested in that um, but I'm also a very quiet person in general so if anyone wants to I don't know find me based on my voice you're going to have a hard time because I have to talk first uh, but that has given me away sometimes I've had people come up to me at events uh, very very cautiously like they shouldn't have figured out who I was and the uh, then tell me, yeah, I've heard you on the podcast. So my voice does give me away, but yeah, just something I deal with. It's a lot better than photos, though. I can eh, photos. Photos are the real problem. Uh, having having people know what you look like gets you found a lot faster. Yes, that's very true. Uh, but do you think that mask wearing actually helps with facial recognition? Uh, I mean, that's not something I studied. Uh, it, again, it all depends on like the accuracy of the, I, I, re I, anyone who's interested in this, I would recommend Adam Harvey. Um, he's someone that I follow that he actually does research in this area. Um, 
I don't know. I just, in general, I feel like anything obscuring your face helps because it kind of limit, like if, if the camera is not capturing you at the right angle or it's not close enough, anything that obscures any part of your face could mess up its ability to accurately capture you. It all depends on like how the system is being used and how accurate it is. Um, and also, you know, whether there are actual humans watching the footage, which humans, uh, in a lot of cases are actually better than the facial recognition software that comes with cameras. Um, it's just a matter of the amount of material that has to go through. That's why they've automated it for the most part. Um, but the most important thing about facial recognition is, uh, especially if you figure out what kind it is, uh, it's about obscuring particular parts of your face. So you may be able to completely trick one of these systems just by, for example, obscuring your eyebrows or your cheekbones, um, small parts of your face, not even like wearing a mask or anything. If you just mess with those aspects, its ability to analyze those important parts of your face, you can completely screw it up. Um, so that's, uh, there, there's a lot of like makeup and clothes, uh, being designed around this area, um, in terms of its ability to trick facial recognition. And some of it is relatively simple and you wouldn't expect it to work, but it does because it basically just takes the biases of the machine and the focus points of the, the machine into account. And a lot of that can be simple, like cheekbones and eyebrows and stuff like that. Yes, but I, I wonder how even, you know, other recognitional, uh, features like, you know, for example, the jacket or the outfit that you're wearing or, you know, the, the size of, yeah. of your feet or the steps that you take. There are so many unique ways that individuals behave, uh, that can be used at least to track pseudonymous identities right? and, and to follow them across different points in time or location and, and maybe even to ultimately find out their, their real identity after all. Yeah, if you want to be uh, completely comprehensive, you really have to make a lot of changes to your life. Um, I mean, in terms of that stuff, uh, there are, like, just modifying your shoes can, uh, if, if your, you know, gait is being analyzed, some of the recognition tools do that. They look at people's gait or walking style. Um, if you just modify your shoes or wear different shoes... Uh, if you want to walk somewhere where you think you're going to be surveilled and you don't want to be captured, you can modify your gait yourself. You can change your shoes or wear different shoes, things like that. Um, clothes also, yeah, can be very identifying. So be aware of that, which is why, like, I don't walk around with, uh, I've never walked around with like Bitcoin memorabilia or t-shirts or anything. I only wear those in private contexts, like, you know, individual, like, uh, I'll, I'll not wear it until I get to the meetup or the conference or something where obviously then I'm there. So my interest is obvious, but in general, in public and in other contexts, I don't wear that kind of thing because I don't want to broadcast my interest in that to whoever may be watching. Um, so that's something I do that I think a lot of people don't, and maybe they should. <laughs> um, and yeah, in terms of yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things to consider if you really want to avoid the surveillance state to the fullest extent, uh, including not completely not entering or living in certain countries, unfortunately, because a lot of them are just not, uh, they're not viable anymore for being able to do that, um, especially some in the financial aspect, like Sweden has basically phased out cash, so everything goes through. Uh, an online banking system. So you effectively don't really have private payments anymore unless you're using Bitcoin. So yeah, there are just some countries that if you want real privacy, they're kind of not on the table anymore in terms of being able to live there. Yeah, that, that will be quite interesting. Um, uh, and, and again, maybe there can be some tricks if we employ Bitcoin, uh, like getting prepaid debit cards, for example. Um, things like these might, might work. Uh, but again, by default, without using Bitcoin, that's quite a, a bad place to be in. Yeah. Okay. Well, Janine, uh, Janine, thanks very much for, for coming on, uh, the podcast and, and sharing a bit of your knowledge about, uh, privacy and, and how it affects journalism. 
Uh, I think it was really interesting to get to learn more a bit uh, about your workflow and uh, maybe to see where else we can take that in the future. Uh, so thanks for the conversation. Yep. Thanks for having me. We'll do it again. Yep. Uh, a, a quick, where can people find you and what's the play, uh, best place to, to reach you and to help you out? Uh, the places you can, well, most people know me through my uh, Twitter profile at J9Rome and then the newsletter if you just search for this month in Bitcoin privacy on um, GitHub, uh, you can find it there. and. Also on YouTube with Block Digest and some other things. Uh, not, not, uh, not too many places on the internet. Um, and then if you want to reach out to me privacy, privately, I have Keybase and Wire and I use basically a lot of the encrypted messaging apps. So that's also there. You can find those on my profiles. Okay. That's great. Uh, then thanks again and talk to you later. Yep. Bye.